So, you know, my take is, is still protein's important. I think it's, you know, we've, we've said this before, you, and I think you said it, if you're going to overeat, quote unquote, overeat something, protein's not a bad choice. So, you yeah, know, definitely put that in the machine, but, you know, exercise, exercise is the winner, kind of hands down. So stay active, stay strong, because that's still a good idea, particularly as you get older and protein's a, a, a secondary consideration. So happy to have you on again. And this is always a pleasure to have a chat with you about all things protein, all things research in your area. I think it is very, very passionate. The things you do, I love talking about protein in general all the time. <laughs> so how have you been? Welcome to the show. I know that you recently published a systematic review that seems to be very, very interesting on protein intake to support muscle mass in adults. So tell me a little bit about this paper. And I know that generally the, the, some studies can be uh, targeted or my the conclusions might benefit specific population. Let's say people, adults overall, or is it over people over 65 years old? Like with this paper, the conclusion and the takeaways, can you say that it is applicable to everyone? Is it particularly specific for someone over 65 year old? What yeah. are some of the takeaways as well? I think I'll start out by saying that, uh, you know, a, a lot of people during COVID, when, when research was paused, thought, oh, well, we'll do a systematic review. And, you know, we, we were probably right there with everybody else. And it was, you know, we had published a, a, a pretty big systematic review previously. And we came together actually with a group of researchers from Europe as well on a granting agency called ILSI, which is a, an industry liaison uh, partner group. So we had people from very, very different perspectives looking and, and saying that, you know, this is the question I'm interested in, this is the question I'm interested in. And I said, well, you know, generically, what we want to know is if people eat more protein, uh, does it do anything for their muscle? It just, just generically, you know, more protein, is it better? And, and then they said, yeah, I, yeah, that's interesting. But what, you know, what about when we add it to people who are doing resistance training? So we said, yeah, okay, that's a, that's a question within the broad umbrella. We can look at that. And then people said, well, what about older people versus younger people? So I'll, I'll say this, we tend to get studies that cluster around individuals who are about 22 years old. They're, you know, university, college age uh, students. And then we get people who are 60 plus, right? So everybody wants to know what happens in between. And, and, and the, it's, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer. We've tried to do those studies in those people, but they're busy. You know, they have kids, they have jobs, they, and so it's really difficult to do studies in that population. Although I'll give a shout out to, to Nick Bird, a former PhD student of mine, now at the University of Illinois. They just completed a trial that was done in, I think it was like 40 to 50 year olds. And, you know, lo and behold, the, you know, the older people are here, the younger people are here, and the 40 to 50 year olds are somewhere in between. So maybe we're not missing that much. And then we had some other questions to do with, you know, plant versus animal protein and everything. But you do a lot of work to come up with sort of two or three simple takeaways. And the first takeaway is that uh, protein does add to the effect of resistance exercise, but it's a very, very small effect. And okay. I think it's sort of, it, it, for me, the takeaway there is protein is important but exercise is far more important. And so, you know, people say, what can I do to maximize my, my gains? And I'm sort of like, I'm always like, well, go to the gym, do it regularly, work out with some high effort and, and, and the gains come. It, it did, the analysis did show that there are some age specific effects. If you're an older person, and this is based on the number of studies that are there, it was really the, the doses of protein that were closer to about 1.6 grams of protein per kilo per day. So twice the RDA were, were better. And for younger people, it was a little bit above 1.6 where we saw the benefits. So, you know, these are intakes that we, we, we've said for a long time, you definitely need more than the RDA. They do benefit people, but, but it's a pretty small slice on top. And so, 
you know, if you're going to ask me what's more, I'd have to say stick, stick with exercise. Not that protein is unimportant, but my favorite, you know, my favorite macronutrient, of course. And simply eating more protein, and we didn't have many studies in this category, doesn't do anything. And so there's where I think there's a bit of a disconnect between intervention studies, which have never shown an effect, and studies that are observational. So when we look at people who have higher versus lower protein intakes, especially as they get older, people with higher protein intakes tend to have more muscle. They tend to be a little bit stronger. They tend to be able to perform better on physical performance tasks that we, when we bring them into the lab. But then again, the, the effects are relatively small and not entirely consistent. So, you know, my take is, is still protein's important. I think it's, you know, we've, we've said this before, you, and I think you said it, if you're going to overeat, quote unquote, overeat something, protein's not a bad choice. So yeah, definitely put that in the machine, but you know, exercise, exercise is the winner kind of hands down. So stay active, stay strong, because that's still a good idea, particularly as you get older and protein's a, a, a secondary consideration. I want to, I have a couple of questions about that. Like looking at your study and even like all conclusions, when we think about the methodology, are there like provided all things are equal, let's say people are having exactly the same amount of resistance training, the same sort of equated nutritional intake that provided like they're, they're, they're not in a deficit, there's more like isocaloric diet, adding more protein by default at something else or is not necessarily that beneficial? Maybe not necessarily just thinking about the strength, but more so in body composition changes. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, the one thing that does come out, I, you know, we've written on the, on the weight loss side of things that, you know, there's, there's probably four pillars on which the, the whole thesis that, you know, more protein is, is better in weight loss sort of stands. You know, the first one is there's a, there's a greater thermic effect associated with protein. Nobody's going to argue that. That's probably beneficial from, a, you know, keeping fat lower and lean higher. But from the standpoint of, you know, appetite or satiety, protein is also top of the heap. I mean, it's, it's more satiating than carbohydrate. It's more satiating than, than fat or lipid. So again, it's, a, it's another great choice. The other point is, of course, it's, it's going to prop up muscle, right? So in an energy deficit situation or in uh, you're trying to gain muscle, then it, it's the, the substrate that's important to, to support that. And it's the tissue that you don't want to lose in, in weight loss. And, and then the flip side is you get a little bit more fat loss if you're in an energy deficit. If you're, you know, close to energy balance, I, I think there could still be benefits. It could be satiety related. The other, and this is an interesting one, most people sort of uh, maybe underappreciate this, is that the more protein you tend to eat, particularly from animal sources, but plants too, the more nutrient dense your diet becomes, because there's a lot of other things that come along in protein containing foods that people tend to underconsume. The older people get when they sort of, their dietary intake shrinks, their calorie budget shrinks, they, they'd actually benefit a tremendous amount from increasing the, the proportion of their energy that they get from protein to improve what we call the, the nutrient density of their diet. So more calcium, more iron, more vitamin B12, more zinc, et cetera, et cetera, which are you know, what people call nutrients of concern for, for older individuals. So in a recap, you say that overall, when we're thinking about someone, like all the benefits being equal and looking at someone who is potentially aiming for fat loss, protein is going yeah. to have probably a stronger effect versus someone who is a, at maintenance because obviously it provides you with different benefits, including higher TEF, protection of lean muscle, in the reducing uh, appetite and increasing satiety, and also potentially increasing that nutrient density availability overall. So obviously looking at these four pillars, it makes sense to add it mostly or increase it for a period of energy deficit. But when we think about maintenance, 
you're saying that it is likely to have a kind of a probably a mild effect, yep. but you still see benefits from having higher protein versus lower protein in a maintenance state. You know, the closer you get to maintenance where you could sort of tip over into energy surfeit and you're, you're beginning to, you know, potentially gain body fat, you look at the three major macronutrients and, you know, fat is, fat's easy to store as fat, no problem at all. A carbohydrate can, you know, you can make fat pretty easily. And I know a lot of people say, well, you can make fat from protein and, and you can, but, but, but it's a pretty inefficient process. It's not that, you know, protein carbons don't end up in fat. Some of them do, but it's a pretty poor lipogenic substrate. So, you know, in terms of calorie balance, if you're going to sort of get, okay, I'm pretty close to balance. I'm, I'm not gaining or I'm not losing, but I could sort of, you know, tip over into that gaining side of things. If you're doing it by tipping protein, quote unquote, over the level at which you're going to maintain energy, then it's, it's, it's not going to be as bad for you as carbohydrate or fat from a body composition standpoint. I've heard a lot on debate on this particular topic of what happens if you overfeed on protein. Now, yeah. I hear few sides of the coin pro-protein and other, point, other people trying to sort of say, look, obviously energy balance at the end of the day matters the most. So if you were to consume more protein above your maintenance calories, what happens is you probably don't store fats necessarily coming from the protein, but what about the other macronutrients that were still part of that total energy intake? So maybe you're not storing protein necessarily as fat, but you're going to use the fats or the, pro or the carbohydrates that you consume. Yeah. But now my question is, let's say that last, the last, last meal is what makes you get to your calories. Yeah. But the last meal could def define whether you stay within your calories or you go below, beyond your calories. Yep. Now, my point would be, or my question is, what if that last meal, like let's say you already processed and digested your previous meals, carbohydrates, protein. If the last meal was pure protein, let's say right. I ate. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. White yeah. protein it's, or yeah. egg whites. Like there's yeah, no yeah. additional macronutrients. Yeah. What happened yeah. then? Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it's a great sort of thought exercise, isn't it? And, and, and this is, you know, I, and I've sort of, I've used similar scenarios with my students when I would sort of talk to them about this. And, you know, it, 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 what we put on the label with foods is obviously we take the food, we put it in a bomb calorie and we blow it up and that's the energy that it contains. And, you know, people sort of get that and I say, okay, but there's a little bit of difference between that, you know, that's a pure, that's a great system, very efficient I said, we're not. And, and they sort of, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And I said, now think about the way nutrients are, are handled. So fats and carbohydrates are, are fuel. They have very, very little other role. They just, they're stored, they're burned. They have some structural elements to them. But, you know, like we've said this before, yes, you can live without carbohydrates, not, not my choice, but, but people can, no problem. And you only really require small amounts of essential fatty acids. So, you know, you, we could probably drive fat pretty low. Again, not my choice. There, here we go. So then the question is, you know, what's the difference with protein? And the difference is you put protein into your body. It's used to make the structures. That is not something that happens with carbohydrates or fat. So it has another role. And then the question becomes, you know, what do you do with the leftover? And so, like I've said before, everything has a mechanism of taking off nitrogen and, and disposing of it. Your fish, you make ammonia. Your bird, you make uric acid. Your mammal, you make urea. So you will do that. And eventually you'll, you'll beyond the amino acids that you can use, you'll, you'll make urea. And the carbon skeleton that's left over gets burned. It's turned into glucose because you didn't 
have any carbohydrate and some will eventually find its way into fat. But you're right, it's, it's metabolically less efficient as a substrate to store and burn as energy for fuel. But if you keep consuming a lot of protein, all of those systems kind of upregulate and you get better at using it as a fuel. So it's sort of six, one of the half a dozen of the other. But to your point, I, I think the point would be is that you would feel satiated, you would feel full, that you would definitely hit your protein requirements. And it, it's not the, the meal that would sort of put you into a fuel storage scenario, if that's the right way to say it. So, but it's an interesting uh, thought exercise to, to go through. I, I think the point is, you know, as a substrate, it's, it's, the, it's the one that if you're body composition conscious, you would, you would want to focus on a little bit more. It makes sense, but it's, it's, it's also so, so confusing because I am someone who really likes having my clients on a higher end of protein intake. And sometimes, even for myself, I find myself easily eating more protein than what I should be do eating. And it's, it's sort of my tendency, it's my preference. So sometimes I've noticed that I could be at maintenance for a long, long time and overeating protein potentially a little bit beyond my maintenance calories. And yeah. I don't see changes in my, my weight whatsoever. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, my own personal experience is the same as well. You know, you go through those periods where you just, like, if you really, really focus on protein. And so, you know, it's not impossible to get, you know, three, four or five grams per kilo. I've seen lots of people on those types of intakes, not at energy requirement, closer to, you know, energy deficit. And they say, oh, I don't feel too bad. Like I don't feel hungry, et cetera, et cetera. And then the change that they experience is, is yeah, it's, it's not a gain in body fat or even maybe a loss in body fat. And, you know, they'll swear that they maintain their lean. I'm not quite as sure about that, but, you know, if they're lifting, that's the primary stimulus to hang on to lean mass. But to, you know, to your point, yeah, I, I, I agree. Although I did read a post of yours on Instagram about a late night binge on, I forget, was it marshmallows or something, or I can't remember what it was. And so, yeah, you know, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. So. <laughs> now, let me ask you something that I've been thinking about as well. And you mentioned that one of the properties of increasing your protein intake comes with a benefits of increasing satiety now mm. how how satiating is protein really when we think about is only the protein that makes it satiating like a meal that makes it satiating or what about consistency texture mm. other nutrients mm -hmm. fiber yeah. and i and i ask you this question because i could potentially have a protein shake and it's 25 30 grams of protein or yeah. I could double it and have twice the dose. So let's say two scoops of whey protein. I, I drink it and 45 minutes later, I'm starving. Yeah. And I had a lot of protein, but sure. I'm not sure. full. However, sure. if I had perhaps the same protein dose, but I add fiber, let's say mm -hmm. I make put some thickener in it and I make like yeah. four, four liters of that same thing. Yeah. Um, I'm full for... Two hours. <laughs> right. A little right. But yeah. it's a, so when we think about the effects of satiation, is it particularly the protein that has a specific effect or is it something else that makes it much more powerful in your satiety cues? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, so my, my, my writer statement is I'm not a satiety expert, but I'll say this is that uh, by being the protein and muscle guy or protein and exercise guy, I've, I've had the real a for, good fortune of, of going to some great conferences and being either the speaker before or after one of about three or four of the, the world's leading 
satiety people. And so I've learned by osmosis by listening to their talks. And, you know, so these are people like Marguerite Westerterp, Rick Mattis, or Harvey Anderson, or these types of people. So it's been, it's been great to learn. So, so I think that the, the, the takeaway is, is this, or Heather Leedy is another one who I, I always learned tons from her, her talks. So she, what Heather would say is that there's a tremendous difference between, you know, liquid protein, a la your shake, and, and solid protein, right? So solids digest slower, they empty from your stomach slower, they, they tend to be more satiating. So 50 grams a, as a shake that you're going to drink as a liquid versus 50 grams of protein as a piece of chicken, very different types of responses. There's no doubt that dietary fiber, because of its, you know, depending on soluble or insoluble, it's sort of, you know, expanding effect in terms of food volume creates a, a satiety response to, I think, you know, the two of them together, you would think, yeah, okay, I get it. I get a feeling of fullness and it lasts longer. That would probably align with most of what we understand about how we interpret signals of satiety. So it's either something to do with gut hormones saying here, you're full, you don't need to eat, forget it. Or it's something to do with actual physical stomach distension, or there are amino acid transmitters. And so there's lots of theories, but I suppose the idea is, you know, if I eat something, how long does the effect last? In other words, you know, do I feel hungry, like you said, in 45 minutes? If it's a liquid, that's probably understand. So the thickening aspect, you know, people add oats or, you know, lots of other psyllium fiber, these sorts of things probably adds to the effect through some sort of physical chemical property. So yes, protein ahead of carbohydrates, ahead of fats, definitely. Liquid protein, not as good as solid foods, which tend to fill you up. Uh, a little bit more. But again, solid protein, probably one of the better choices out there. Add some fiber with it. So, you know, broccoli with your, your chicken breast, then it's, it's probably a pretty good combination. And I guess it comes down to looking as well, like we, there are some people that are the outliers of these that love eating protein, but the general people or like generally generally speaking someone normal wouldn't be as prone to eat as much protein sources or protein containing sources so when you increase the protein i suppose because of the where you find the protein seems to be like chicken beef it's not that appetizing it's not like a highly palatable as you would with like a muffin or a cake or a cookie or things like that you probably wouldn't wouldn't be prone to overeat it so much so that's another point of feel satiated or or having lower likelihood to overeat so yeah some of that is governed by you know when people talk about uh low carb high or fat one of the feelings is that uh, maybe it's sort of food quote unquote boredom you know, in other words, you're like, oh, you know, I just, I can't eat another, you know, stick of butter or something like that. You know, not to be trite, but I mean, the, the point is, is if you restrict foods down into a smaller category as you, like, I like chicken, but do I want a chicken breast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know, four or five days? No, no way. And so there's a palatability aspect, you know, some people, I have a sweet tooth, they gravitate towards sweet, rewarding foods. And if you restrict things, then it becomes, you know, it's just, if you can handle it, it's just boredom. You're just like, you know, I, I kind of want to eat this, but actually I really can't eat this. So I don't know whether that's playing into the equation or not, but, but to your point, yeah. I, I, I mean, I just, I like bread. I like pasta. I like, I like rice and I like chicken. I like fish. So, uh, you know, I'm vegan. I'm like, I get it great way to eat, you know, super healthy, planet great, just not the way I choose to eat, so. I wanted to ask you your stance on a, a very common statement that I, I think you could, you have done quite a lot of research. This is a statement of all protein is not created equal when it comes to quality. So yeah. tell me your state 
uh, your stance on what do you think about this statement? When it comes to quality, are all proteins equal or not? So I'll give you a, a little bit of career history here. Ask me that question when I first started at McMaster 20 plus years ago. And I'd have said, yes, absolutely. There's differences. I think they're pretty, you know, animal proteins are better than plant proteins. So, you know, if you're consuming purely plant protein diets, you're, you're going to be at a disadvantage. You know, 15 years ago, I've been like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's still the case. 10 years ago, we're like, hmm, uh, geez, you know, five years ago, I'm, I'm not so certain. And now I'm beginning to think that that quality issue is a little less important than, and, 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 you know, like I'll be hand on heart honest. I think that we, our lab has written uh, papers and reviews that would say to people, but Phillips thinks that proteins are quality is important and it is. But when we think about in the context of developed westernized societies where people eat a lot of mixed sources of proteins, I'm not sure that the quality of the protein is really an issue or as big an issue as we once thought. I think the fundamental truism is that animal proteins have a higher quality than plant-based proteins. But if you're judicious about how you plan your diet with, with plant-based proteins and you cook plant-based proteins and you, you sprout you know, legumes, then those are a lot of the things that overcome the digestibility issues. And now we're in a world where, you know, protein concentrates and isolates for uh, plant-based protein sources. Like there's, there's a new one every day. You know, something is, it, there's always something that's, that's new. And I've been pretty impressed with some of the work that we've done and are doing that would make me think that actually it's, it's, it's less of an issue than, than we think, but we, we were engaged. Let, let me just say is that we've got some pretty important work, I think, uh, coming up on that. So have me back in maybe a couple of years and I'll be able to tell you a better answer. But uh, my impression now is that what I used to think were big differences and then like this are now, it, it, there's still a difference, but it's much closer from a physiology standpoint. So from what I can gather, from your answer is that quality still matters, but it is not as, as huge of a gap as we thought it, were, it was before. And you can still have a really good combination of plant-based proteins and like animal proteins and still get a very, very positive benefit from both. Or even if you were a plant-based only, if you were to plan wisely your nutrition, your diet and your protein and choose wisely your protein sources, mostly from like complete proteins and getting your leucine and essential amino acids from animal sources, you could still be able to fill your requirements and get all the benefits that any protein containing food would give you. Is that yeah. the message or am I missing something? No, no, no. That, that was a perfect summary. I mean, I mean, I'll be honest again, it, it's, you know, you're not, you wouldn't be a good scientist if you didn't take findings that you were either part of or involved in, or you read and, and they, they went against what you thought would happen and not change your mind. So, you know, I'll, I'll say that Hamilton Rochelle, a good friend of mine, great collaborator down at the University of Sao Paulo, his group, and, you know, I, I, I was involved peripherally. I helped them plan the studies. This, this is what I think you should do. And I said, yeah, but I, I think that, you know, the people on the, an animal protein, the omnivores, they'll come out on top. But we got these, these vegans using protein supplements and to get them up to the 1.6 grams that we think is sort of, you know, that's going to be the adequate amount of protein. And the gains in muscle mass and strength between the two groups were, you know, is virtually identical. So I think that you can eat enough protein as a vegan, again, if you're judicious, to maximize those types of gains. And yes, we use soy protein. So ostensibly the, the best plant-based protein that's out there, but it certainly didn't handicap anybody in terms of gaining muscle or gaining strength. So, and then after that, and you're involved in, and your name's on the paper, how can you really say, well, yeah, it makes a difference. It may, if you're below that level, but even then, 
you know, roll back to what I said right at the beginning, the protein effect is it's a thin slice on top. So I don't have any skin in this game. Like I'm not a, you know, I don't own shares in a protein company or anything else like that. And, you know, you can probably do it with lots of different forms of protein. When we think about the digestibility of protein, then would that make a huge difference when it comes to getting enough? Let, let's say the, t the type of protein may have some effects. If you weren't to be very wise or cautious about your choices and you are a plant-based only person who only eats protein from plants, would the digestibility or the type of protein that you choose make a difference then if we were only to focus on plant-based yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, we, I've had these conversations, you know, with a lot of people who are, who are plant-based people, you know, Nan Nancy Guest, Simon Hill, and these guys, and, you know, the, the point, and they make it pretty, pretty clear is that, you know, they're good vegans and, and bad vegans, quote unquote. So, you know, good and bad in terms of, you know, at least being judicious about how you plan your diet. So, and I saw a phrase on Twitter the other day, somebody called them Oreo vegans, like, you know, you can eat Oreos all day and it's a vegan diet, right? So I get it. You know, you, you eat a slice of toast and I have a Diet Coke and you're a vegan. It, like, so yes, if you, if you restrict your, your, your foods and they are vegan foods or they fit into a vegan pattern uh, to a small selection and you don't vary your diet much, then digestibility may become an issue. And I've sort of made the point to say is that in food insecure places in the world and people who are food insecure through either income issues or whatever it is, and they're relying on you know one or two or three things as a staple, then yes, they could be at risk if it's if it's vegan source foods or or a vegetarian source foods that they are they're eating. You know, contrast that with somebody who now has an array of products in terms of, you know, different types of plant-based meats, quote unquote, you could probably pretty easily, even with a little bit of planning, vary your protein intake and then digestibility becomes a non-issue. I, I, you must have clients and I've dealt with a few athletes that are vegans and, you know, a couple of them have a world championships gold medals. So who am I to argue? Right. And then everybody will say, well, imagine how much better they could have done. And I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, I think actually that's part of the, the shtick is that it's not just vegan to vegan lifestyle, but they're very judicious about how they eat. And that was at least my, has been my experience. So, but yes, there are, there are crummy vegans out there, just like there are crummy omnivores as well. So. Now, let's move to another point that I am interested to hear your thoughts about, and I know that you have re written about this before, and it's about current recommendations for protein intake during a fat loss phase. I know we did mm. touch a little bit about this, but why is protein so important during an energy deficit? Yeah, I, well, you know, we went over this sort of tenets around, you know, why in an energy deficit protein would be a better choice. I, I do think in the end, the effects, at least, you know, in our hands, we did, we, we've run one really big trial in premenopausal, so younger women. We had women that were probably on average, I want to say about 25, 26, but we had some women easily into their mid to late 30s. And we found in the protein source that we, it was a dairy farmer funded study, the protein source in that, you know, being rich in dairy and maybe calcium played a role and maybe because the, the foods were fortified, maybe vitamin D played a role as well, that we actually saw, you know, a greater fat loss. And even in a pretty protracted 16-week energy deficit, these women gained lean mass, you know, and that was associated with a greater improvement in strength and and. So, you know, that effect in women, I know we're always asking, does it work in women? Actually, we, we did it in women before we did it in, in men, but I think it's still the exercise stimulus is the, the overriding issue that gets you to gain the lean. It's not just, you can't do it with just protein. So protein, you know, clearly is the substrate to allow you to hang on to muscle. But if you just eat more protein, you can hang on to a little bit more, but it's emphasize much more when you're performing resistive exercise to give your muscles a stimulus to hang on to lean. When you do it in men, uh, 
similar story, not quite as pronounced as the women, but a different design. We used a massive energy deficit. And when we did that, we actually found that these guys preserved lean on only 1.2, but I think that's the exercise effect. And they gained lean on 2.4 while being in a 40% energy deficit for uh, four weeks. Is there any specific recommendations when we think about different sports, like endurance versus resistance training or strength training? Would you have a specific or a different recommendation if we were to talk about these as endurance athletes versus a strength or resistance training athletes? Uh, you, you know, this is it's maybe a message that's being forgotten. You know, I go back to one of my, my big influencers, mentors, good friend, good colleague uh, here at McMaster, Mark Tornopolsky. And, you know, he's got a paper from 1988. He did nitrogen balance. And uh, if you've ever done those studies, they're they're not that much fun to do in controls and then some pretty elite bodybuilders and uh, endurance athletes. And the endurance athletes actually had the greatest requirement for protein over and above the bodybuilders. And it's really because endurance athletes are, they're, they're just oxidizing machines, right? They're, they burn fuel like crazy. And even though protein or amino acid oxidation is only a small percentage of you know, where they derive their energy from, a small percentage of a large expenditure adds up and, you know, their, their protein requirements were, you know, orders of magnitude higher than the controls, but even higher than the bodybuilders. So I, I don't know that the, the, the recommendations are specific. Uh, in days past, I might've believed that that was the case. I still think that most people are going to get exactly what they need if they eat the amount of energy that they need and they're hitting a, at least sort of 1.6 grams of protein per kilo per day but but some some endurance athletes particularly multi-sport endurance so triathletes for example or if they're doing extreme sports may need to go a little bit higher but it's because of the oxidation yeah and a little bit of repair and regeneration i don't dismiss that at all but it probably surprises the uh, the resistance training guys to say uh, you know what you're you're gaining muscle but it's a small amount to do that whereas these endurance athletes are blowing up pro uh, protein on a, on a daily basis. Now, moving to a population that I, I work a lot with, and I, you probably have done too as well, which is obese populations. Mm. Do you think there might be a superior effect on body composition changes if we were to use much higher protein intakes versus lower? That, let's say you put a client who is in, in, has obesity, and they want to lose weight and you put them in a deficit, let's say 20, 30% deficit, probably you can translate your results that we already have discussed into yeah. this population. Yeah. But does it make it even more, I don't know, it, is it makes it more interesting to see effects on people who have lower lean body mass and higher body fat to have higher protein intakes makes any difference or it's pretty much the same? I think it's the effects are there. I mean, it's still the magnitude of the deficit. And, you know, we've, we've already agreed that's driving the majority of the loss, obviously. The difference is in the composition of what's lost. And, you know, protein tends to shift it more towards fat than it does towards lean. And so you're, you're, you know, you're ben it's a benefit in that situation. But the big shift comes from if you can get somebody to be a, even a little bit more physically active. So if you're an obese person, and you know, this is an, it's an interesting sort of a gain thought exercise, but some obese people, you know, you, they can't physically do enough endurance exercise to, to quote unquote, I'll just say to matter. In other words, you know, the, the energy deficit that they, or the extra energy they expend through endurance exercises, it's small and, and they're limited because their aerobic capacity is lower, et cetera. Uh, I'm actually a bigger fan of trying to get them to, to do some resistive exercise. First, they find they can do it easier. They can achieve, I'll call it mastery of the exercises much quicker than they can with the endurance where they sort of, you know, they're pounding away and this sort of thing. But, you know, everybody wants to create an energy deficit through aerobic exercise, but actually 
if you can make somebody stronger, you know, in our experience, and I refer back to the, the trial we did in the premenopausal women, for them, and we actually worked with a health psychologist in that study, their, if you like, self-esteem or, or self-efficacy of being able to control what they had control of improved, and they mainly or always consistently referred back to being stronger. They actually did like the fitter, you know, doing more. They talked about strength as a real driver of what made them feel better about their their weight loss experience. So, you know, I I I know it's not used as often, but I do think that there's some merit to to practicing resistance training in that group, and then that shifts everything towards. You know, anything that you're going to lose almost is, uh, particularly with higher protein, is going to be fat mass. And uh, all the meta-analyses and everything that's done would, would back that up. Calculating specifically protein requirements, and again, going back to these obese populations, there is this sort of confusion whether you should be calculating their protein requirements using the lean body mass, or would you recommend calculating their protein requirements Maybe if you don't have their lean body mass or their current body composition, utilizing their height in centimeters, let's say they, their height is 165 centimeters tall, would you utilize that number as like the minimum amount of protein they should be consuming or perhaps calculating their ideal body weight? What would be your best recommendation when you are not necessarily aware of what is the current body composition, but you probably shouldn't be targeting either 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight right, and they right, are like right. yeah two kilos or 100 kilos or 100 yeah 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 i mean you know let's let's be clear right i mean if you have an estimate of you know lean soft tissue mass fat bone free mass or even fat free mass that's what you would love to base your protein recommendations on and so you know take 1.6 grams per kilo kilo, you know, divide by a smaller number, which would be your fat-free mass, and it obviously gets higher, right? So it could be as high as, you know, 2 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of fat-free mass. Let's, let's say that. So if you don't have that information, I think you're right. You know, if somebody is 100 kilos and they are 30% body fat, then you don't want to base a protein requirement and try and give amino acids to fat tissue. It, it, it just doesn't need that much protein. You want to feed the lean mass. So no question about that. I, I think in that scenario, you've got two choices. First, you still use the, the, the person's body weight and maybe take off sort of 10 or 15% and just acknowledge that that's, it's going to be an overestimate of what they need. Is it feasible? Can the, or does the person say, well, I can't, I can't, you know, this is too much. Like, and, and so it doesn't align with their preference, then maybe dial it back some more. Ideal body weight, sure, usable, I suppose. And the height thing, again, that's the second person this week who's brought that up. I've never heard of that. I don't know if height's a good proxy for estimating how you want to feed somebody. I, I, I stop short of sort of saying, you know, height is important. And I, I do remind people that, you know, the acceptable macronutrient distribution range, which we sort of seem to have forgotten about, says that intakes of protein between 10 and 35. So that's the high end of total energy intake coming from protein are, are still fine. So for somebody, you know, let's say they're in a weight loss period for, you know, three, four weeks, and then we're going to level them out and we're going to, you know, maybe let them have refeed week or just a break week, call it whatever you want, which, uh, you know, I know that you're a fan of and I think they're great ideas too, even for a mental break, if nothing else. You know, so in those scenarios, I, I, I don't have an issue with, with a short-term period, like, and it's relatively short, where people actually, quote unquote, go on the high end of protein. Because I don't think it's, you know, it's not bad for somebody, as long as it fits within a, what they like, B, the foods are sort of acceptable to them for a short period of time. I don't think you can go wrong or do harm to somebody in that period of time. Beyond that period of time, then assumably you would make recalculations based on their new weight that is again now we're coming closer to their body fat is coming down and 
you know, the body weight might not be a reasonable uh, estimate to use. But if you can get lean or fat free or whatever you want to call it, then use that. I, I think I brought it up the height thing because it seems maybe it's, it's in the, the way I was taught in, at the university and also like the way I have encountered different ways to give my, my patients and my clients a decent amount of protein that at least is above 100 grams of protein. Like I would yeah. say, if you want to eat protein, at least like you should, at least the minimum would be no less than 100 grams. Sure. Like for anyone, yeah. I don't know, I don't care. Just yeah. keep that minimum. And then whatever <laughs> sure. else is going to be adjusted uh, according to your current baseline, how much you can eat, and what yeah. are your true needs based on the calculations of 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. Sure. I do yeah. get the other half of the equations when I am in hospital, that they are still mm -hmm. recommending generally a, a, a range between one. 1.0 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight sure. and yeah. that doesn't go beyond that so i, I get these mis mismatch thoughts why why is hospital and like the clinical patients are still getting the recommendations so such a low recommendation between one like if you're 67 kilos you just need 67 grams of protein is that yeah. is that optimal or why are we still getting this amount of protein recommendations where all new research states that especially if you want to have a population like elderly 65 year olds and all yeah. over yeah. retaining lean body mass and especially if you're in a rehab setting where you are yeah. actually resistance yeah. training getting much better outcomes out of their sessions and their rehab set, uh, time they're spending in hospital why are we still recommending one gram per kilogram of body weight yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think a lot of it is older practices just die hard. And, you know, a lot of people, clinicians especially, are still under the, you know, high protein causes kidney kidney failure. It's a, you know, it's a Brenner hypothesis. It's, I don't know, 60 plus years old now. And again, you know, I was saying earlier today in a webinar, I'm, I'm like, it's, we're searching for evidence that that, that actually is there's a causative role for protein. And even if you look at the observational data, which a lot of nephrologists will, you know, sort of parade up and down based on one or two studies, when you look at the systematic reviews that are out there, you can't find an association. You can't, you definitely can't find a causative, you know, i.e. randomized controlled trials do anything to kidneys. So, you know, at what point is, and I get it, you know, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, but I'm like, so it's been 60 years, you know, where's the smoking gun? Where's the, where, where's all the clinical data? Why, you know, why aren't these people who are consuming the, why aren't they dropping dead of, of kidney failure? And a lot of people, well, they are. And I'm like, no, they're not. Like, like, look at the observational data. So, you know, that one falls down. And, and then the next one is, well, bones, bones will dissolve with more protein. And I'm like, that's unequivocally un untrue, been shown so many times now, we can forget about that. And now people go, well, protein, you know, it cuts down lifespan. It's, it's anti-longevity. And, and I'm like, oh, okay, so what's that based on? And they're like, well, you know, these, these wow. mice in a cage or fruit flies or something. And, and I'm like, well, yeah, okay. So find me some some human data and you can't you got to go with observational trials and then again i think it's it's hard to find a connection between the two that would make me go yeah low protein is is good particularly for older people so to your point and i'll say this is the bottom line i think consideration for a lot of hospitals is money protein is the most expensive macronutrient starch and and fat is is cheap relative to protein so you know you you aim for the minimum as opposed to the optimal and the and the definition of optimal is is much harder to pin down than than minimum, which we can you know probably use nitrogen balance and all agree that that's you know so we we just got to change the name. It's instead of recommended nutrient intake or recommended dietary allowance, if you just called it minimum dietary intake, I could walk away. I'm a happy man. I'm like no problem. We just call it. That's the minimum. That's you know that's going to get the minimum out of you, and it's nothing you know that's optimal. Then uh, I'd be happy. But yeah, I, I, I don't think the RDA or the RNI or call it whatever you want. Like I don't think it's I, I don't think it's going to change. Uh, there's just not enough of a groundswell of uh, support out there right now. I think hospitals probably don't like me having me around because. <laughs> Every time I, I see a patient, 
I literally go into the software where you manage their diet codes, and I literally almost put everyone in a high protein diet. But like, mm. what? Why every time she's around, us two is around, every patient has a high protein diet. Yeah, <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, you, you know, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, when they, when people do, you know, good studies of what people eat and it's not just you know here's the tray and they just assume that you eat everything on the tray because nobody does there's always something that people just go oh, i'm not eating that on a hospital tray as you know and you actually calculate it luke van loon you know a good friend of mine uh, in maastricht has done some work showing that older people who went in for you know orthopedic surgery so knees hips and that sort of thing were consuming 0.6 grams of protein per kilo per day mm. and you know so this person is having a, a joint replacement and we're, we're giving them, you know, so they're on bed rest and um, we're giving them like, it's not enough, it's barely enough protein to sustain them. Forget about, you know, recovering from surgery and, 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 and you know, being and healing well. It's, it's ridiculous. So, I yeah. totally agree. Now I have a very interesting question that you, you probably would, could have the answer. I'm not sure. But uh, I'm interested to ask it anyway. So sure. would, ha would having a slow digesting protein, aka casein, yep. pre-bed, if you were a shift worker or someone who tends to have poor sleep, we know like sleep generally tends to increase lean body mass loss in general. Yeah. And if it's even worse if you're in a calorie deficit when you compare two groups people who yeah. slept well and people who didn't sleep well, they lost more muscle mass than yeah. the ones that did not. If you were to have more protein, especially around the period where you're sleep deprived or you're having, it, it doesn't have to be necessarily casein, but it could be just more protein containing foods around the mm -hmm. period where you're more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Would you have better protection from muscle loss? Yeah. Uh, or what are some like? Is there any inherent benefit from consuming protein, perhaps yeah. around the time you're sleep deprived or you're not necessarily yeah. sleeping, and you should? Yeah. That's an interesting question. I, I I don't know if that's if you would. I, I'm not sure. I, I think you know. So I mean, all of this again is it's there's not there's, we haven't done work in this area. Luke Van Loon's group in Maastricht, uh, Mike Mike Ormsby, uh, Florida State, they, they've sort of controlled this space. I mean, I think the casein issue is the slow digesting protein. I'm not sold that it has to be slow casein, but you know, we'll, we'll sort of gloss over that. But but you, you know, your points around sleep deprivation and you know shortened sleep cycles or disturbed sleep, uh, yeah, absolutely on point. Pe hospital patients in particular, they lose uh, a lot more lean if they are on a shortened sleep cycle. It could help. It it can't hurt for sure. I, I, you know, my experience with pre-sleep protein is, is most athletes, if, if I suggest it to them, they're like, sure, you know, I can try that. And they're, they're good with it. Some don't like it at all. Some say it disturbs their sleep, which is interesting, but you know, if you're, yeah, as you point out, if you're in a real stressful time and you know, you're, you're getting shortened sleep, it, 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 it could help. Again, the big driver to undo all of those negative effects, and I've only had been involved in one small study, and it was with an Australian group at Victoria University, is we found, you know, again, not surprisingly, if you do some exercise, uh, it, it really does offset a lot of those effects. So I'll, I'll, I'll mention that as a, you know, an, imp an improvement that is separate from protein. But if you can't get the exercise in, then protein may help. It's a good, good question. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think it's more mostly targeted like provided you're already training and provided yeah. that you're already doing everything right. Like I could put yeah. myself into the, that scenario. Like I'm someone mm -hmm. who sleeps like probably six hours, six hours and a half or six right hours same, during, same. during a week, uh, on a weekly basis. And sometimes mm -hmm. I might sleep a little bit less than that because I tend to go to bed like at 2 a.m. or 1 a.m. And oh, I wake okay. up around 8, 8 a.m. <laughs> like right, right. now. Right. And generally, I have I tend to have a pretty good sleep overall. But the first thing I, I try to do, and it's again, it's, it's my tendency, is eat something just before I go to bed. And to, I lately mm -hmm. I've been consuming more casein, just yeah. because I'm hungry. But at the same time, I yeah, some, yeah. want to have something, and I generally have that protein-based right. supplement. 
Right. And I wanted to hear your thoughts because I probably could be having better gains if I were to sleep earlier or more or longer if I could but I am kind of yeah. very consistent with my pattern I tend to go to bed any every day on a regular basis late and I right. try to keep the same length of the sleep which is yeah. no yeah. less than six six hours but right. my question would be if you were a shift worker or someone who is not necessarily getting eight hours of sleep could you benefit or have less negative consequences with your body recomposition while you're trying to improve it if you were to have additional protein before bed? So this is a, a tricky question, but I um, yeah. wanted to hear uh, your thoughts on that. It's a great scenario. You know, I sleep a short amount, but I'm the opposite of you. I'm in bed by like nine o'clock. I hate to say that, you know, but then I'm up at like, you know, sort of three in the morning or some four in the morning. That's, that's, that's my routine. I think that from what I understand of sleep, it's about more about the consistency and the pattern and then the quality of the sleep that you do get that matters. So if you, as long as it's regular and that fits with your lifestyle and everything else, and if you're an athlete, it fits with your competition schedule, then I don't, I, I don't see the issue. I mean, I, I'm beginning to appreciate having a, or have a much greater appreciation for the role that sleep plays in changing body composition or in athletic performance in general. You know, every, every team in the NHL and the NBA here in, in, in North America employs some sort of sleep consultant. So, I mean, I don't know what qualifications they have, but they tell, you know, this is when you should sleep, this is when you should practice, everything else like that. The protein issue and the timing around the sleep, again, I think it's uh, it's an interesting thought. I, I certainly would think that, you know, on paper, everything that we understand about protein metabolism would suggest that the meal before you sleep is going to offset some of the overnight losses. And there have been some studies that have backed that up. Tim Snyder's uh, from Luke Van Loon's lab you know, being primary amongst them. There are other there are other papers and other studies that, that haven't found the effect. So, you know, you you kind of wonder, but I don't think anybody's done it in the scenario that you suggest of people with, you know, sort of light dark flips, so shift workers or people who are, you know, sort of going from one shift to another. The hard part I think with those folks is that it's just, you know, the timing of their sleep then is is changing every, you know, whatever it is, two, three, four weeks. And that's the that's the real tough thing to to combat yeah. so yeah it, it, it would be interesting uh, to have those folks you know manipulate some of their dietary habits to see what would what would happen but I don't know that we well we definitely don't know the answer but it's it's an interesting question for sure that's awesome well do you have now a, a new question for your research students put it out there <laughs> yeah 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 that would be awesome yeah. to have yeah. about that it's it's a tough one to to regulate. Whenever we've done, uh, like I've only been involved with one sleep study, and as I said, it was the group of Victoria University who were with Dick Bishop who were who were doing this, and they had a little sleep lab, so they could tightly control that. And so I'm beginning to understand that if you want to do that work, you've you, you've really got to have the 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 ability to you know disrupt or control or regulate people's sleep. So it's okay for acute interventions to get people on a shortened sleep cycle, but chronically, maybe maybe if you had enough shift workers who would agree to you know, some sort of dietary intervention, that would be interesting for sure. Do you reckon doing a free living study would have too much air? Well, as, as I say to my students, like the more you can control, then yes. the sample size gets smaller. The less you can control, then as you say, so free living studies, uh, you've either got to have a large sample size or exercise some degree of control over the people who you have. I mean, one big population that really does, you know, it's, it's sleep work, they're extraordinarily sedentary as well, are, are long distance truck drivers. Yes. And and they're, they're a huge segment of the Canadian and North America, you know, employed population that, that really have sleep rhythms that are, it's just ridiculous. And also have then the associated, you know, poor lifestyle and everything else like that. And, and then, exorbitantly high cardiovascular disease and everything else so anything that you could do to offset that or mitigate it somehow would i think anyway be pretty beneficial that's what i'm thinking like even if we there were there were preliminary results on like maybe they're not as strong very strong recommendations but can be at least give some guidance like yeah maybe it likely you might benefit from having a slightly higher muscle retention if you were to have a little bit more protein closer to the time that you should be sleeping or if you're sleep disrupted yeah. increase your protein 
intake by 0.2 or 0.3 based from your baseline, from your current yeah. baseline. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, good, good theory. Easily testable. Okay. Oh, not easily testable. That's not true. Testable. I think, you know, I'd like to see a control design first and then probably then, you know, if it, if it shows something, move it into uh, bigger populations, but lots of practical ramifications for sure. When does supplementation with essential amino acids or BCAA become relevant or when are they important if, if they I mean, I, I don't think I've made any ever made any secret of my my views on branch chain amino acids. It, they're they're three amino acids of, you know, the the nine essential that we need. So the best they can ever do is give you a partial push in protein synthesis for a short period of time. And other people say, oh well, they 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 alleviate soreness, and I think you know that effect is overestimated by a lot of people. They certainly don't augment any training responses that, that you can see in lots of reviews would would back that statement up. Essential amino acids is, you know, as a supplement, on the other hand, are a little bit different. Then you've got all of the essentials and presumably that's all you need. And you've got enough of the non-essentials that your body can make and it can sustain a full anabolic response. And there's been some very impressive studies, mostly out of Bob Wolf's lab when he was in Galveston, but then also when he went to the University of Arkansas, uh, that would show that these, these supplements are, are pretty beneficial. The, the main, I think, edge that they do have is that for the calories that they, you know, that count in an essential amino acid supplement, it's very low and you can still get the full and robust anabolic response. The problem is, is most people still like to eat food. So, you know, how do they fit into the paradigm of, you know, where do I get my food from? Uh, you know, will, will these essentials, you know, add something to what my food is already giving me. And, and the answer to those questions, I think is, it really depends on how much protein that you're eating. For most people who are on high or protein diets, for example, taking essential amino acid supplements or branch chain supplements uh, is not gonna do anything. It, 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 it's, it, they can't add more to what the food is already giving you. So, you know, in those situations, I think you'd have to sort of say, well, there's probably not much more that they can do. But if you're in a, you know, very low energy balance situation. I do know that David Church, who uh, now works with Arnie Ferrando, formerly in Bob Wolf's lab, they're doing a lot of work with the military where, you know, some of these, you know, forward operators are carrying about 30% of their daily energy requirements in their pack. And that's all that they can handle. So they're looking at the use of essential amino acids in that population, maybe to augment and prop up some of the lean mass that they might lose while they're on a mission. And that would be you know, that'd be pretty efficient, right? Because it's just a little bit of powder as opposed to something maybe bulky, but you know, these, these soldiers still like to eat as well. So it'd be interesting to see where a lot of this goes. Yeah. Or even like if it's just whey protein, wouldn't be the same though yeah. or better? Yeah. 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 Well, uh, you know, th that's an interesting question. And I do know that, that David and Stefan Pasiakos, uh, Jess Gwynn, I think is the first author on the trial, have compared the whey to the essential amino acids and at least from a whole body protein synthesis standpoint, they get a much more robust response with essential amino acids than with whey protein, which, oh. yeah, yeah, I, 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 it always puzzles me too. But I think the, the, the hard part is, you know, most EAA concoctions, from my perspective, don't have a great taste profile. I'd much rather have whey protein than, than essential yeah. amino acids, for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And, and when you compare whey versus casein, is it, a huge big of a difference when it comes to quality or not really? No, I mean, the two of them together, actually, milk proteins, pure and simple. So forget about separating whey and casein. They're the highest quality proteins, bar none. You can't get anything higher. Individually, they're still very high quality proteins. They, I mean, they go down just a little bit, but it, it's interesting. You know, a lot of people talk about slow digesting proteins. And the reality is, is that the only two truly slow digesting proteins that I know of are casein because the way it aggregates in, in stomach acid and uh, cooked eggs, like the egg protein, it's the gelatinous matrix and it's digested relatively slow. Everything else is just varying degrees of fast. <laughs> so people say, oh, whey is fast and then hydrolyzed whey is faster. And my point is that actually everything is pretty fast until you get to casein or, or, or egg protein. Yeah, it, it totally makes sense. Now. Just a, a quick follow-up question about egg protein. I do get this question a lot. Does it make any difference if you have like pasteurized egg whites versus just raw egg whites 
or cooked white egg whites. Yeah, yeah. In uh, the quality, I and I know your answer, but I, I need to put it out there. What is your sense of drinking? No, egg no, whites? no. It doesn't have any effect. I mean, the one big effect that I always say when people want to talk about, you know, eggs or raw eggs versus uh, uncooked eggs is well, your risk for salmonella is uh, is much higher with a raw egg. And you might run into, you know, some sort of uh, biotin deficiency because avidin binds biotin in, in a raw egg and it doesn't in a cooked egg. So, but after that, I'm like, you know, who still eats raw eggs for goodness sake? But I, I get it. Some people are, it's still a common practice, but there's, there's no difference in quality or anything else like that. I, I love eggs. I love eggs. So I, I eat them and I cook them. <laughs> I've seen this a lot. I cook them so many different ways too. <laughs> I've seen this a lot in like people who make smoothies yes. first thing in the morning, they add egg whites. They might get more protein out of it. Like cooked versus uncooked, like the difference is not much. What about like amino acid availability? I, I don't think there's, I mean, so the only thing that would differ is it, with egg whites or, you know, your, your smoothie situation, you would get a more rapid rise in amino acids, but it's up and then down. So that's sort of the fast protein concept. Whereas cooked egg whites are much more slowly digested. So that's the egg, you know, matrix effect that's cooked and it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit different. So yeah, that, that is possible, but I think for most people, you're probably eating mixed meals anyway. So unless your smoothie is the only thing that you're eating, I, you know, you're eating something else later on that, you know, these are, these are minute details in all of this whole process. So I'm not sure where they come up, but but they do. And I, and I have to say to people, I'm like, you got to think about that a little bit, you know, cooking eggs versus raw eggs. And, you know, so the people who survived on cooked eggs, they have less muscle than the other people. And I'm, I'm just, I got to, I got, I got to kind of glaze over a little bit. People like overcomplicating things, you know, that. Or, or just overthinking things. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I, I, I don't know where these things come up. It's, it's just incredible. So losing the light in here. <laughs> I, I am almost done. So what are some of your next future projects? I know you have a lot of cooking at the moment. So yeah. what, are some, what are some of the good things that are coming up for you? Yeah, so two two big pushes in the future. Uh, we've got some work looking at older people on plant-based diets, you know, because as we mentioned, you know, that's something that maybe is important. And we've got a real push on doing some work in in women and, you know, full acknowledgement of our inability to be able to grasp that women probably respond in some regards different than men. So we have to begin to understand, you know, what uh, a lot of the things that we've said work in men, do they work in women? Do they work the same? Is the, the effect the same, et cetera? And they're completely underrepresented as a group, and particularly in exercise physiology, but in physiology research, pure and simple. So it's uh, a situation where we're, we're trying to remedy that. So, so stay tuned. Awesome. Well, Stu, it was a pleasure to see you and to have a conversation with you. Like always, all things protein and yeah. kind of race, race dating, everything that you always say and you find in your studies. So that's awesome. And it's always great to catch up with you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks. Thanks for having me around, Astrid. I really appreciate it.